Welcome back to Green is Good, and we're going from New York City all the way to Westwood, California, and we've got on the line with us John Christensen, who is an adjunct assistant professor and Pritzker Fellow in the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability and the Department of History at the University of California, Los Angeles. UCLA is in the house. John Christensen, welcome to Green is Good. Thank you. It's great to be here. Hey, John, you have such a fascinating journey to getting to where you are today and all the, the great work you're, you're doing. Can you share with our listeners a little bit to how you became John Christensen and, where, and how you got to where you are at UCLA right now? Well, I've been an environmental journalist and science writer for 30 years now. I've written for the New York Times, for Nature, the Journal, for the Western newspaper called High Country News, and many other newspapers, magazines, journals, radio and television shows. Uh, About 10 years ago, I had a mid-career sabbatical fellowship called the Knight Journalism Fellowship at Stanford. And in, in 2002 and 2003, you know, and this is a time of really great changes in both journalism and the environment. And it it persuaded me that with all these changes that are happening, there are really interesting opportunities at the intersection of journalism and university research, uh, nonprofits and and philanthropies, and that as we see, uh, you know, this kind of tremendous breakdown and fragmentation in the media um, that we're all really concerned about particularly as journalists, particularly covering um, the environment, that there were all, uh, all kinds of interesting opportunities to create new coalitions and new uh, partnerships, um, new, new ventures, to really harness all of those energies and continue to elevate the, the, the public conversation about the crucial issues of our days. And so that's uh, when I decided to stay at the university um, to uh, work on a Ph.D., and I w- was at Stanford for 10 years, uh, directed a center for the American West there, and then came down to UCLA uh, last fall because of the terrific opportunities here in Los Angeles, a great uh, global city, a diverse city where people from dozens of countries speaking dozens of languages, facing all of the kind of global environmental challenges, uh, but also uh, opportunities uh, that, that, that we have here. And so it's a great laboratory for thinking about the environment, particularly in an urban setting and, and, and um, you know, understanding the challenges we face and the solutions. That is so great. I mean, it's such an important work you're doing. So you teach a class at UCLA called Environmental Communications in the Anthropocene at UCLA. And, and I want you to share with not only me, but all of our great listeners out there, what is the Anthropocene and what does that mean to all of us? Well, the Anthropocene is a new geological era proposed uh, in 2000 by Nobel Prize winning atmospheric chemist Paul Kreutzen and his colleague Eugene Sturmer. And anthros meaning human uh, and then the anthropos meaning human and, and the scene being the geological era, they propose this as a new era that we're in defined by human domination of Earth. Our influence is felt everywhere. Mm-hmm. Human population has increased more than tenfold in the last three centuries. Urbanization has increased tenfold just in the last century. 30 to 50 percent of the Earth's land service surface has been transformed by human action. We eat more than 25 percent of the primary production of the oceans, more than half of all fresh water is used by humans. We're transforming landscapes. Species extinctions have increased by a thousand to ten thousand fold in tropical rainforests. Um, we're leaving a signature now in the geological record. That's what defines these geological eras: is shifts in uh, the, the, that are that are visible, detectable in the geological record. We're leaving a chemical record. The increase and sulfur dioxide from burning coal and oil is now you know, at least two times larger than all natural emissions. More nitrogen is fixed synthetically and applied as fertilizer than fixed naturally in ecosystems. As we know, greenhouse gases have increased. You know, carbon dioxide by 30%, methane by more than 
you know, a hundred percent. So we're leaving all kinds of uh, evidence in the geological record. There's a lot of debate about when this era started. Was it when at the beginning of industrialization? Was it perhaps further back when human agriculture be- began uh, transforming the Earth's surface and atmosphere? But it's very, very clear that we're uh, now in a different kind of era. And what does these shifts and changes then mean to the whole, you know, since you're a journalist first, how does, you know, how does these shifts and changes interrelate with environmental communications then? Well, I think what it means is that nature and humans are not separate. Uh, there's no pure nature. Our, you know, our fingerprints or our footprints are everywhere, and we need new stories. Uh, we, you know, the traditional story that we tell about, uh, you know, the, our relationship with the environment is the story of the fall from e- Eden, is the story of decline. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, trying to get back to nature and get back to some kind of Eden. But we need new stories about going forward with nature. Uh, human beings will be a major force even geologically on earth from now on we need to get good at it and we need to get green about it is and and what but wait a second this is so are we moving from is this a post inconvenient truth era now and the storyline should be different than what they were five six years ago is that what you're positing i'm a little bit confused I mean, I think that I, you know, I think I think that's right. I mean, as as uh, one of my friends and colleagues, Andy Revkin at the New York <laughs> Times um, says, you know, the the old story of you know, woe is me and shame on you, just doesn't work. Right. Uh, you know, we're all in this together, uh, and we need to find solutions. You know, I think I think uh, you know Al Gore's uh, message, you know, has helped right. show us that. Right. And and so so tell me about what your vision is. Where should we? Where should the communication environment now interrelate and intersect, and now take it to a whole nother level and, and platform issues that the next generation can go out and tackle. Well, so the, the, you know, Los Angeles, New York, uh, the you know, big cities of the world are great examples of this, and the growing, okay. particularly the growing cities uh, around the around the planet that are going to absorb all of the population growth in the next forty years and double um, in size. These are densely connected places of right. communications networks of mobile de- devices and you know this it's no longer we can no longer think of communications as a kind of one way pipeline into people's brains that decision makers policy makers scientists can you know deliver a message you know through the media and people will absorb it that really never did work but it's very clear it doesn't work anymore there's no one reliable source it's a conversation sometimes even a c- cacophony um, right. but, you know we have to go where the conversation is scientists and uh, scholars and researchers need to participate in the public square and f- Many are not used to that. It's uncomfortable for them. But that elite model of communication, you know, that we can sit in our labs and come up with new knowledge and then it'll be reliably transmitted, you know, through elites to everybody else, it, it, it's, no long, it's no longer working. We, so it's, the new model of communications is a, is a conversation. And, you know, we have to, we all have to participate in that. And these new technologies, these dense networks of communications enable us to. It's challenging, but we need to do it. That's so interesting. You know, my friend Alan Hershkovitz at the NRDC, when he came on the show, he talked about the issue of science, sports, and the environment. And he said, listen, John, and he was sharing this with our listeners, only about 13% of American we- Americans, when polled, really are into science, but about 68% of Americans, when polled, really enjoy sports. So he says, we have to go in and green sports now because we've got to go where the people are. So I totally get what you're saying. That makes a lot of sense, John. And for our listeners out there who just joined us, we're so excited and honored today to have John Christensen from UCLA on with us. And if you want to see more of John's great work and what he's working on with the anthro- anthrosapine, uh, you could go on to his website, ChristiansenLab.net. It's, it's Christiansen with an E-N-S-E-N-Lab.net. 
It's uh, it is a beautiful, and wonderful site. I'm on it right now, actually, uh, John. And you're 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 working on so many interesting things. So talk about what's on your top of mind when you wake up in the morning. What are some of our greatest environmental environmental challenges that we face today as a society, as a country, and as a world? There's four grand challenges that we face in this century, and particularly in the next uh, two generations, the next 40 years. Um, And and I think about this a lot because I spent the last 21 years uh, telling my daughters, uh, you know, don't let the bastards take your future away from you. You know, we tend to say to young people, uh, they get the message that, you know, sorry, we screwed up and it's only going to get worse from here. I, you know, I, I, I don't think that that's the message that we should be giving to young people. And I, you know, I don't think that it, I don't think that it's an accurate one. We do face incredible grand challenges. You know, one, one of them is a uh, growing population, but it's not the problem that we generally think of as just a problem or a challenge of population. It's urbanization. The planet is, uh, the population of the planet is going to grow from seven to around nine billion over the next 40 years. Those two billion people are going to end up effectively in cities. That means that the urban built environment on the planet is going to double in the next 40 years. How that happens is going to fundamentally determine not only how we live with nature, but how we live with each other. Climate change is the second one. And the challenge is no longer just how can we mitigate or lessen climate change by reducing our emissions, but how can we adapt? Uh, Change is coming. Uh, it, that is going to mean it's going to be hotter in many places. It's going to be drier in some places, wetter um, in others. We're going to deal with, uh, you know, changing water regimes, uh, less snowpack in California. It's going to change our water supply, sea level rise. These are all things that we're going to need to adapt to, and we need to start thinking about that now. But it also means that there are ways in which we can change our cities to make them more livable, uh, change our our cities and other places to make them more livable, more enjoyable, more healthy. The third major challenge is biodiversity loss, and particularly also the fraying of the ecosystems that other species depend on, but that we depend on too. And the fourth major challenge we face is sustainability. Hmm. And how can we not only, you know, think about sustainability as the ability to continue what we have now, but sustainability, what does sustainability mean in a world of great inequality? It's clear that that's not sustainable, that many people around the world uh, need and deserve uh, better lives, and they will have them. So how do we figure out how to think about sustainability in that kind of world where we need to think about the well-being of people as well as the planet? It's interesting. So, you know, you, you do a lot of research, and you're also writing. And right now, we're going to talk about it a little later. You're writing a book right now called Critical Habit, A History of Thinking with Things in Nature. But before yes. we get before we get to that, talk a little bit about you at the top of the show. You talked a little bit about the excitement that you have about working at UCLA and teaching at UCLA because it's in a in such a diverse city. Your research on city nature um, sh- share what that means to you and what that means to your students and to your research at large. Well, when we think about nature in cities, we've often thought about um, cities as a place where nature is not, and we go out of the cities to get back to nature, go into the Sierra Nevada, you know, uh, go out into um, the wilderness. But, you know, cities are made out of nature, and there is nature in cities, and it's also in cities that that have been the birthplace of environmental movements, environmental concerns, environmental laws. We also have a very long history of conservation of nature in cities for people in nature, and that gives us a really diverse toolbox for thinking about people and nature that I think is going to be very, very helpful for us, as I said, in the next 40 years as the urban population and urban built environment doubles on the planet. 
if you think about the history of of nature and cities um, in, in you know it, here in the United States, it, it tends to go through a pattern where first we think about protecting nature for protecting watersheds for clean water for people living in cities. Then we think about enclosing the commons, the commons being the you know the common grazing areas yeah. and uh, for animals uh, in, in cities. Those are often then you know enclosed for uh, for, for for parks. Um, they're turned into parks. The third phase for recreating good citizens, for recreation, for 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 creating good democratic citizens. That we need places for people to recreate, um, to recreate, to recreate themselves. Then we have what's often called the city beautiful movement, an aesthetic movement of thinking about the importance of beauty and of nature as part of that beauty um, in cities. You know, we're moving into the 20th century, uh, particularly in the post-World War II period of great economic booms. Uh, there's the movement for conserving nature for open space, for, for aesthetics um, uh, arises. That then turns into a movement for thinking about those open spaces as habitat for other species. And it's important for us to provide that kind of habitat in our urban and suburban metropolitan matrix. Finally, we're now in an era where we're thinking about those open spaces and, op and, and habitat and nature in the cities as providing ecosystem services for us, that they're f protection from floods, that they clean and filter water, that they, you know, clean and filter um, the air. And, you know, that goes full circle back to why we first, people first thought about conserving or preserving nature in cities, as I said, for clean water. And so I think in going through that whole history, you see we have a, whole, uh, we have a wide range of reasons, very good reasons for thinking about conserving nature in cities. And that provides a diverse toolbox for us to use in making sure that as we continue to build new cities, to grow cities, and to bring back nature into cities, that we have a lot of different ways of thinking and talking about this, that it's thinking about how nature is important for people as well as for other beings. John, we're down to the last minute and a half or so, but I want you to just touch upon the issue of uh, th that you've talked about on your website and in your lectures of crowdsourcing and how that interrelates with environment and the uh, what you're trying to accomplish right now. So we're doing a really fun project up in the San Francisco Bay Area around the year of the Bay, which is this year the opening of the new Bay Bridge there. The America's Cup races are coming to the San Francisco Bay. And we're opening up this celebration to all of the people of the Bay Area and the world, people who have come to and enjoyed the San Francisco Bay Area, to see if by listening to diverse communities, diverse people of the Bay Area and the world, we can crowdsource a new environmental history. Mm -hmm. I really believe that there's lots of different ways of knowing and valuing and relating to nature. And we've often only thought that there's kind of one way of being an environmentalist, the, the sort of, you know, 20th century environmental movement way, but we now know that there's lots of different ways of thinking about and relating to the environment. What we need to do is ask the question, how do you relate to the environment? What do you think of nature? What's important to you about nature? How do you value it? And if we ask those questions and listen, you know, we can, we can, we can, we can hear uh, the many different ways that people do that. And it helps to build a much more diverse uh, constituency, movement, uh, public for the environment. Thank you, John. And, th and John, we're going to have you come back when your book is written, Critical Habit, A History of Thinking with Things in Nature. John Christensen from ChristensenLab.net. John Christensen, you are an environmental and sustainability thought leader and truly living proof that green is good. Thank you. <laughs> 